Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's nine o'clock, it's time for a talk magic and today I'm here with somebody who I genuinely consider to be a legend in the magic community. This is somebody who has literally written the book on mentalism, he has been responsible or has been a key part of more magic and mentalism products than anybody could ever imagine. Super creative, super nice guy. I've worked with him several times on several different projects, and he just is the perfect example of professionalism and, and talent. I am, of course, talking about the one and only Phil Smith. How you doing, Phil? Hi, Craig. Um, that, um, that intro was incredible. It was well worth the £50 you told me it was going to cost me to pick me up that much. I deliver. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I don't know like if people realise just how many projects you're a part of and you've had a hand in oh yeah i'm everywhere you are <laughs> you're like one of the best kept secrets it's like you know producers and companies and creators hushed voices under their breath yes phil smith you need to go see phil, phil smith about this I, I think that i've just been i've just been doing it for a while and i think that there's not there's not that many people who are doing what i'm doing it's sort of like i'm people might not know but i do a lot of graphic design and illustration and stuff within magic and mentalism but i also develop magic so when people come to me like we have we literally we sort of just been talking about a project just now before this interview so we switch the curtain back a little bit on that but you know when you're talking to me about a trick and how it needs to look that i understand the trick in a way that if you were dealing with somebody who was a graphic designer who perhaps wasn't involved in magic in the same way that i am that is going to be a whole two-hour conversation so mm -hmm. i think that that's one of the reasons why i've ended up like and being I've had, on a lot of people's uh and i've had desk, that well yeah i've worked on projects before with people who are incredible designers but they don't know the first thing about magic and so trying to get them to understand what i'm trying to get them to understand is almost impossible because the, their head doesn't work that way whilst you're a creator and a developer of magic and mentalism immediately i can say to you this and you can picture it in your head and because of that you know that not only do you know the best way to actually put that together but you'll probably make an improvement on it as well I mean th that happened you just said we were talking off camera about a project I suggested one thing to you and you were like you know what you can do that and and you made it better immediately I mean that's that's part of what you bring to the table and very few people have that yeah I hope so yeah I think it's quite interesting being it, one of the things that I like most of all is this sort of like being able to help you know use some of the technical stuff that i know to be able to bring somebody else's like vision for a project to life like they know how they want it to feel or even look but they don't necessarily know how to get there so i can like do that last little bit of icing on the cake it's nice so i really like doing it oh absolutely now for those people that don't know you or aren't aware of your work we're going to delve into everything but for the, for the people that don't know you, I want to do a bit of a frame of reference. I want to talk, first of all, about your origin story and how you came to be in the magic and, and mentalism community. How did you get into magic? Where did it all? Because I, as far as I've been in magic, I, I, people have talked about you. But at some point, you, you got that bug. At some point, you started magic. Where, where was that? How did that? Yeah, so when I, when, I was a, a, I guess just, when I was a kid, I had a, a magic book in the house and I learned how to do cards. It was a... a you know, like a book of, of, of card tricks for the regular day. And I kind of always been interested in, 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 in that. Then I went to um, university in Leicester, in the East Midlands in the UK. And it was a kind of, uh, it was around about the time that Darren Brown's first TV show was um, airing, when he sort of like first hit, you know, the, the, the world. And it was also kind of very much near, this kind of dates it a little bit, near to the broad use of the internet. And so I was just uh, watched his first special, knowing a reasonable bit about magic and being like, how much of what I'm looking at is real? And like, obviously there's a lot more about magic that I don't know. And so I kind of started thinking of it perhaps a bit more seriously about it's something that people learn and, and become good at. And then I found that there's a, a, a magic club in Leicester, the uh, Leicester Magic Circle, which is one of the oldest magic societies in the UK, and went along there and, and, and sort of got involved and joined whilst I was still, um, you know, at a university so about 20 years ago. And <laughs> there's just, for whatever reason, there was a brace of 
like excellent magicians there, people who I found out are quite well regarded. Um, and I, I got to sort of like, you know, hobnob with them and, and learn a lot from them. And it gave me this framework to be able to sort of cut my teeth because they did these events where I could go out and do um, close up mm -hmm. and you know, begin to understand how to apply the things that I've been learning for years, just performing informally and met a load of people and made friends and then gradually became sort of integrated with the world of magic that we're sort of all you know, fascinated by and, and interested in. And it's kind of sort of blossomed from there that it kind of dovetailed a little bit with my, you know, I was learning this at university, but I was also learning design. And my, you know, my background um, is in art and design. And I've always been developing my own material and just kind of as an exercise decided to write down all of the stuff that I've come up with and do some design work to like create a book which was my first book which was this book called my talks which kind of like outlined my ideas about how to perform mentalism and I think that it just sort of that gave me an opportunity for people to see some of my mentalism ideas but also that I could work to help other people bring their ideas to life because I was, you know, I could lay a book out and help them go to print and stuff. So that kind of a thing brought me into the beginnings of doing what I'm doing now. So and, and now, I mean, I want to talk about how you got to where you are now, but now you, pre I, I, I don't know the answer, so I, I might be wrong, but you predominantly work for, um, your clients are mainly in the magic industry, in the entertainment industry, or yeah, it's, it's, it, it, I, I do have one client at the moment who isn't involved in magic, but almost exclusively the work that I do is um, within within the industry. So working to do some sort of like promotion and stuff for people who do their you know shows and gigs. So just like regular magicians who need branding or a business card or. A, booklet or a leaflet or whatever for a wedding fair or a pull-up stand or whatever that stuff's really nice because it's nice to get in touch with people and help them maybe take the next step in magic mm -hmm. and, and their sort of magic development and career but then also I do a lot of work probably most of the work at the moment is doing sort of design illustration development work and some consulting work for people you know like yourselves who sort of develop magic for other magicians and work within the industry so i've got a few sort of regular clients that i do quite a lot of stuff with and then every now and then i've been doing work with big companies like murphy's and penguin to sort of help them take projects where they've got perhaps a creator who's got an idea for a project but they need particular visuals doing for it so yeah it's kind of like it's, it has all come about that i've ended up doing like almost exclusively designed for the magic industry that was never the plan <laughs> it's probably a bad plan <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you've got a huge name in the industry so it you know it's worked out absolutely 100 percent. but what was that the goal i mean when you finished university what was the goal was the goal to be a full-time performer and just perform or was it to take your degree and go in a different direction or uh... no i i, I mean the the um i've i've never i've never been a full-time professional performer and i kind of like when i when i teach i always explain that my my main job is working with other people to help them with their projects and and, and to for the material that i develop i've used a lot but the the majority of the people in the world who are performing it are other people not me um when i finished university i had no real intention of being a professional performer um but i wanted to develop a professional level like i wasn't desperate to be going out and working and doing gigs but i wanted to do those so that i could i, I don't know just look i mean i mean it, it wasn't a big plan but like whatever it is that you get from performing magic other than getting paid i wanted that i wanted that i wanted to be in front of people and and show them this stuff that i was super excited about like i, I like I, I i love watching this stuff i love watching magic and feeling that oh my what what the hell was that and I, I love being able to provide that for other people. So kind of what I wanted to do was become good. And um, and that was just like doing doing shows and doing gigs and stuff was what was necessary for that. Like the people that I knew when I was in Leicester are people who like did loads of stuff. Like, like the, when I was there, like the 
one of the old boys who was there was Roy Johnson, who I later found wow. out was instrumental in creating what we currently think of as modern close-up. He mm -hmm. was like a legend. He's just this old guy who was there who just talked about this stuff. I didn't really know who he was. And I was like this um, Moz, Mozee, who a lot of people might know from his development of this decisions. And the, I think it was the Cobra Shark, like loads of, you know, if you go to Alakazam at Blackboard, he's there, demo. the guy's a legend. He's an incredible thinker. He was just one of these dudes who was there. Scott Creasy, who's a brilliant mentalist. Yeah. He was there, just one of these guys who were, you know, full-time professional gigging magicians who've got this incredible high level. I used to like really like idolize and, and look up to them. So that the, in a way, the only reason why I would ever have wanted to do like commercial gigs is because like, that's what these guys were doing. That's what it means to be a magician. But I'm perhaps not feeling that exact way now, but it, it was, you know, just Definitely. thought that they, these dudes were so cool and what they could do was so cool. And, and, and I think it's so inspirational hearing you because I want people to understand that are watching this interview, being a full-time performer isn't the only way that you can make a name for yourself in this industry. There's so many different ways that you can add value and so many different ways that you can be a part of magic without going out and doing 100 gigs a week. You know, there's so many different directions that you can go in yeah and i think as well a lot of what i th i think that people like younger guys who come in kind of feel like the 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 you so that it's not you're not really what you're doing is in, in magic isn't important or it's not valid unless it's sort of recognized by your peers and that you're re doing releases and stuff inside the magic industry but i, I like the, the 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 most satisfying moments that i've ever had in magic haven't been like releasing a deck of cards. Like that's cool, I like doing that. But it's it's when I've been performing for, you know, like for lay people or even just for other magicians and hit them with something where they've not seen it before. Or like, those are the things, those are the moments that I sort of remember and look back on. Um, and I've been lucky because my position in the magic industry has allowed me to get into that position to do, to do that, access people and like, um, events that perhaps would have been a little bit more difficult if I was just just starting out but that but that's but like becoming somebody that people know the name of in the magic industry has always been a bit of a weird one for me I was at the, I was in Blackpool because uh, like, we have a, a stand quite often at Blackpool um and I was in the I'd gone to get some coffees for the guys like um and I was down in the cafe whilst uh, they were looking after the stand where you can join my friends. And these two, um, these two Scottish guys came up to me and said, oh, you're, you're Phil Smith. Can we take a photo? And the whole time that I was having this conversation with them, I was waiting for whatever the punchline was. I'm like, I'm convinced they're not going to get me. I'm convinced that this is a wind up. And if there was a punchline to it, it flew by me. That's mad. So I still feel a little bit like that. Wait, wait, this person knows who I am. Well, that's kind of weird. I know about I mean, that. It is. A lot of people know who you are in the industry, and I think it's because of how much you've done. When did you? When did you? Um, so, so you wrote your first book on mentalism. Yeah. Had what was the goal as soon as you came out of university to kind of be a creator of magic or to focus on the creation of magical mentalism? And how did that come about? Because there's so few creators, and and you've created a lot of magic and a lot of mentalism, and You've, uh, we've talked about it before, you've, you've helped a lot of other artists, myself included, bring projects to fruition. And I think the fact that you create your own magic massively helps you with that. What made you decide to actually be a person who's literally writing the book on mentalism and, you know, creating your own tricks? How did that come about? Was it a desire to, like, share? I think partly it's, it, it's um, like, I... I I, I can't. I quite like writing, and I've written a, a lot. And, and when I'm sitting down, just kind of like developing ideas for material, often like the in the same way that I might sketch something if I'm trying to come up with a logo, like in a, in a notebook, I would just write. I would just type up these ideas. And even if somebody's got no intention of ever like writing a book or putting a, a document together or an ebook or whatever, just writing down their routines is a really nice way of like working and focusing on the development so I just had done that so I got just a folder on my computer which had just got loads and loads of tricks that I'd written up and just because I'm so familiar with the format of like a magic book you know it's got that like 
name of the trick, effect, a description of the effect method, and then tells you how to do it, notes, and then it tells you some little bits of information. That's just how I'd done it. And after a while, I was like, oh, I've got quite a lot of new stuff in this, in this, in this document. It's quite a lot of different bits and pieces. And I kind of like made it into a book purely as a challenge just to see whether I could do that, whether it was something that I could do. Because I knew I had to do desktop publishing and layout and illustration and all these bits and pieces. Just curious about doing it. And it was at a time when um, print on demand, which is the ability to print one book rather than a thousand books, was coming in. So these systems were available and it was possible for me to print this book without having you know, a thousand of them done. So it was something that was accessible to me, a normal person, rather than having to go through another publisher. So I didn't have to persuade Penguin to, you know, publish this book or whatever. I was just able to do it myself. So there was not, I don't know that there was ever necessarily any goal. Um, and I just kind of thought that other people might find it quite interesting the way that I like, like mentally and the way that I want to feel about it myself so I kind of was like I wanted to put that out into the universe to see if anybody else was like interested in that or felt the same way but it was almost like a little it was mainly just for myself it was like a little bit of a manifesto about how I wanted to think about mentalism and I kind of like I said wanted to see whether, whether anybody else agreed but I've always found it like doing releases like that and I'm sure that you you found the same thing is that um a lot of the time people think that it's kind of like you're, you're putting this thing out and you're saying like this is how it is but the reality is that anything that you release like that is kind of like part of a conversation where you put this out and then mm. people contact you and talk to you about it and like talk about how they feel about it or like so lots of the tricks that i've developed the ones that people like where they they've used it a lot and it resonates a lot with them they'll contact me with information about and say oh oh when i do it i do it like this when i do it i do it like this what do you do when a person says this i'm like i don't know oh well i do this i have this answer for it or i set it up this way and so i mean like publishing my tricks has improved them a lot because rather than just me performing them non-professionally because you know like i said I'm, that's not my main i don't do that all day do as many gigs as you guys do but there's, I know that there's like a hundred people out there who are performing it in the real world for all kinds of different audiences all the way around the world. And so I get to take some of the feedback from that and make updates and, you know, put, put an update on my website or whatever saying, this is a change that I've thought about for this. This is how this should be done now. Or if you're performing this, try doing it like this. So it's like, you, you know, it's not fixed in stone anymore in a way. You know, I've, I've been, yeah, you know, got like loads of magic books, like everyone has. And in the olden days, when you put a book out, that's it. There's the book. Yeah. Like it, good. Don't like it, tough. Whereas now, because people are accessible, people message me all the time, and they're always asking and having conversations about the stuff, the material. Mm. And if I hadn't put it out, those tricks, which I, I you know, I like them, but they wouldn't have moved on. Yeah. Whereas absolutely. because I've done that and put them out into the world, they move on and people do stuff with them. And I get to steal all of their ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I always try to, with credit, stealing with absolutely. credit. Absolutely. So when did you set up your company? Because obviously, what, what what's the name of your company again, Phil? Remind me. Ugh, um, it's pretty complicated. At the moment, it's Miscellaneous Miracles, but I'm going to try and switch to Phil Smith Creative at some point soon because it's, like I said, it's a bit, it's a bit confusing. Okay, but um, what, what, was the, I suppose the question is: When you finished uni, did you immediately set up this company? That or what? What was the journey that got you to? No, the that, you like, I've, no I've, I've, I've worked for quite a long time doing just commercial design and web design and stuff outside of the magic industry. So I have done quite a lot of work. You know, my my dad's a technical illustrator, and so. If you buy a Triumph motorbike, for example, and you open up the handbook and it's got the little illustrations about how to change the oil in the sprocket box or whatever, he would have drawn the pictures that show you how to do that. And I would have drawn some of them back in the day because I've worked with him on that. Or if you go into, I used to do a load of retail design. So if you go into B&Q, which is a big DIY retailer in the UK, 
and you go and want to buy a set of doors, a lot of the graphics that were in there a few years ago anyway, would have been ones that I've worked on for this retail design company. I've done, so I've done quite, I've done a lot of stuff that's not inside the um, magic industry. Um, and, you know, web stuff, which I've sort of stopped doing and, yeah, just just loads of regular sort of graphic design and illustration stuff back in, in the day. But, you know, I, I've, I think I've found my niche. I found, mm-hmm. I, I think that it's useful for somebody to take me quite a long time to do it. But I've been able to sort of combine something that I'm personally interested in with this sort of technical skill set. And that's, but, but yeah, but it was a long time. I've not been just, just exclusively working in magic for the whole of my, um, all of my professional career, for sure. Was it was it difficult to move away from that kind of very safe environment into 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 kind of because now you're pretty much exclusively in the magic industry. At some point, you had to make the change. At some point, you had to say, you know what? It's kind of the equivalent of somebody giving up their job and becoming a full time magician, isn't it? You know, it's well, kind of it, when do you do that? When when did you kind of or did it was it a gradual thing that happened over it, time? It, it wasn't a big. It was not been a big sequence, and I haven't ever really deliberately intentionally try to make it so that I'm only doing graphic design work within magic because I've been lucky enough to be in a position where um, I've had enough gradually more there was more and more magic stuff and less and less of everything else that wasn't magic um, but it's you know it's the I, I could like say oh I've I, I set out this goal and I determined that I was going to achieve this but the reality is that a company that I worked for previously folded. And I started doing freelance work, which is essentially going and being an on-site designer for another company. Um, and that was when I ended up doing a load of retail design, which was interesting. And there's a lot of really interesting psychology in that. Um, and then that company folded, not through any fault of mine. It does look like there's a bit of a pattern forming here, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I started working sort of for myself more and you know the, a lot of the people that i know and people who know my work know it from inside magic so i started doing more magic promotional stuff so like business cards and things like that because that's what i used to do i used to so yeah a lot of the people that i used to know um I, and i used to do like a lot of the design that was like business cards and promotional stuff and, and websites because that's where i you know what i used to do I used to work for um uh like a, just a little local commercial printers and we just do business cards and whatever for everybody and so that was kind of transferred from that mm. and then I think that after I designed my book and I'd done a few books I started for myself because I've written I think I wrote three small books which are called the um, mythology trilogy I started doing a few other people were asked me oh can you do my book can you design my book like people that I'd done business cards for and I did um a few sort of quite high profile mentalism books, which were like big, expensive books. So I did the, the Black Project for Luch, who uh, you spoke to recently. Yeah. Um, and go out for like, you, they trade places on eBay for like five, six, seven hundred pounds a time. Yeah. So, so I worked on a few sort of these high profile, like, like big books that, um, you know, people wanted to like, I don't know, like make it as good as possible. So for example, the Black Project is, you know, like Luch is sort of magnum opus. It's his, yeah, it's his masterpiece, really. The, the stuff that's in it's incredible. And he could have produced it himself just in a Word document or something. And but it wouldn't have it wouldn't have felt like it. He wanted to just to put this thing out so that when people got it, they felt like this is something different, it's something special. So I was able to do that for him, which was great we're still really good friends now i've worked on a lot of stuff with him i did that and then more sort of books because because i'd done it people could see if you wanted to have you know if you wanted to do your masterpiece then i want it to be like my black project well just phil exists you could do it yeah. and then gradually sort of went from there and as in, in addition to that i got the uh, playing card stuff going on as well so i've been doing um, playing card design with my friend Drummond so um, they have gradually become more and more sort well, of well I think we need to possible. talk about that because obviously there's many people around the world that consider the DMCs to be the premium brand of playing cards and the ones that a lot of magicians swear by 
Well, there's some people who think that the uh, DMC elites are the best mark deck in the world ever. And then there's some people who are wrong. And so there's basically those two kinds of people. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> where did where did all where did your uh, relationship with uh, with Drummond come in and how did the DMCs come to be? Again, it's just I think it's just one of those like. Um, like, like word of mouth things where uh, I had done a, a Kickstarter for a sort of weird mentalism deck um, ages ago, back in the day. And someone that I know, and it's either, oh, it's either Philip Escoffi or Mark Cairns. And I can't remember which of those, which is really super rude of me. So apologies, they won't watch this, doesn't matter. Um, but they had met him, this, you know, uh, met Drummond and got talking to him and he was talking about he wanted to do a just a, a deck of cards just a just a promo deck and they were like oh i know someone who can do that so he managed to he got in touch with me and it kind of like it went from there it did he at that point was doing the sort of the run-up for uh, a single one-off special that he did with um nat geo with the national geographic tv channel and it was called the card shark. And he wanted just a deck of cards, the sharks. So we just did the design on that. It was a regular deck of cards um, with, you know, a few custom cards. Like he was the joker on it. And like the one of the kings was, was his sort of profile. And they used that as like the hero deck in the, in the show so that he you know, had these uh, like custom cards. And we did like a small run of them and he was selling them. But he just like worked. It was just a client project there. And we gradually sort of worked on just more stuff. Like I was working on a few sort of background things for him. And he was thinking about doing another deck because I just quite liked that. Like, you know, having a, a, like a bespoke thing when you're performing that's different. No one else has got. It just helps you feel in the same way that you might wear a particular suit or something. Like this is part of the, the brand. And it had occurred to me that it was possible to do a particular kind of marking on the deck because I worked on that on the first deck that I did on the Kickstarter. And that's where I came up with this particular, we call it the optical marking system that's on the uh, DMC Elites. So the first deck that we did with that was sort of still slightly shark themed. It was called the Great Whites. And it was a sort of like weird casino deck with this sort of original version of the optical marking system. Which is, you know, it's 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 been updated and changed quite a lot since then, but still the core sort of concept of it is um, still intact. But that was quite a long time ago. We've gradually refined how we work together, and it's been, yeah, it's been interesting. It's been a long time. We've released a lot, a lot of cards. Which is yeah, I mean, cool. you've gone through so many different variations of the DMC deck and DMC gaffs and different colors. And then you've got the Alphas, which is the DMC Alpha deck, which was the, the yeah. letter deck, which is beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. yeah, yeah. I love that. But I mean, what's been nice about this is exactly what I said about doing the releases with the, um, uh, you know, with the books is that when you put something out into the world and a lot of people like engage with it and use it, they have their own opinions about how it's going to look. So I can just like look on the forum and you see people you know, like, we'll complain about something. Like, oh, I don't like this about these cards. I don't like this about these cards. And you can either say, tough, or you can say, okay, and I can, I can see where you're coming from. It's not that difficult to make that change. So, so it, we can refine it. Now, and one of the things that's been really cool about, you know, working with Drummond and working on this project has been the fact that we've been able to go back and do a lot of iterations on it. So in the in the real world, in um, in like product design, the when something gets released, you know, like the iPhone, for example, they didn't just release the first iPhone and then just go, there you go, cool. <laughs> you know, they released one, and then they listened to and had like they will have had massive amounts of customer feedback and obviously done focus groups and said, what do you want? What do you want to change? You know, what what changes do you want to make? And they gradually make. You know changes to the product to improve it based on what people want and we've been able to do that so we're constantly people always talk to us about oh why don't you do this and sometimes it's not something that we can do sometimes we do it and it doesn't quite work but most of the things that we've done have come about because somebody's asked just asked us why don't you do this and we've and we've not got a good enough reason why not to do it so we'll do it on the next version it's amazing but it's just and it's a it's, it's a bit of a cheap way of improving your product like but you, people are sitting around thinking, how can I make this better? 
I don't know, people are telling you how they want to make it better. So just listen to them. That's great. And it just shows how important customer service is to you as well. Um, one thing you seem to be incredibly amazing at is developing marking systems for playing cards. I mean, genuinely, I've got two decks that we're, we've been working on over the last year that um, both of them involve marking systems and in one capacity or another. And yeah. both of them are very different. It's not a normal deck of cards. And both of those decks, I didn't really, I just said to you, I want them marked. And you came back to me with, on both of them, with two completely different ways of having them marked. Yeah completely different back designs far and above better than anything I could have possibly imagined. Um, that's a real skill. <laughs> you know, it's really yeah. I, I, I was thinking about this recently. And I think, I think that, and I'm sure maybe someone in the comments will correct me. On this, I think I've designed more marked cards than anyone. Certainly yeah. at the moment, just because I've just done, I've just done a lot of them. And it's something that it's not, I'm like, that's like one of these people who's on, you know, gets the world record for doing something incredibly obscure. Of course, no one's done more than you, Phil. No one else really cares that much. But I have, I think I've got a bit of a, a bit of a workflow for it, a bit of a knack for it. And I kind of understand how to like, how to hide something and make it visible. And it's about, it's, it's going to get weird now, Craig, but it's about what your eye or what the, like a lay person's eye will skate past. People, when they're like their vision is based on assumption, and so that when they see something that's like a repeating pattern or just a sort of a, some squiggles or a structure that doesn't really look like it means anything, if there's something more interesting to look at on the back of the card, that I will just, just slide by and just skate past it. Mm. And that it's operating within that space putting the information in so that it's possible for somebody to decode it when they know that it's there or how to do the decoding, but to make it sort of visually anonymous enough that when somebody doesn't know that it's there, there's no reason for them to look at it for any longer than any other part of the car. That's kind of like the, that's kind of the approach to it. And so everything, you know, the things that I've worked on with you and all of the other decks that I've done for like Penguin or, or like my own projects have all based around that kind of idea that it's about disguising something as something like boring or not interesting enough to warrant looking at for very long. Mm. That's pretty weird. That's no, no, it's interesting to go through your thought process. And I, I want to ask you about one, particular, uh, uh, one of my favorite tricks of all times ever in the entire history of magic you designed. Um, oh, okay. Which one's that? We've never spoken about it before, but I love this this trick, which is the snaps deck by David Jonathan and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dan Harlan. That must have been a challenge. I mean, that's so, well, I mean, two decks of cards, and there's so much going on with them. It's the before 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 I, before I accept too much praise for that. The actual images for them, which was if, if people aren't familiar with them, get familiar with them. It's it's like it's essentially an alphabet deck. Where each one of the photographs is, um, it looks like just a photograph, but then in context, it's the shape of a letter. I didn't do those. I didn't do the photographs were pre-done and they arrived from um, David Jonathan, ready for that. So the, the 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 my contribution to it was designing the the backs, which needed to be, or they kind of wanted to be marked in a particular way. Although uh, the trick doesn't really need them to be marked. It's just it's an added bit of value and we figured that it was possible um and also the box we had to come up with the construct about I, I one thing that i quite like about tricks like that is like you end you've got this artifact this physical thing which is this deck of cards with the the, the photos on what is that when a yeah. spectator sees that when you bring it out what is that because if if you like this is a thing that i bought for doing this magic trick with you, you, you've got a bit of an uphill back, battle. To, so we had this, this, this box that looks like it's a load of sample photos from a, like a stock photography thing. And if you don't talk about it, you don't have to say, look, this is a thing that I've got. This is a, you know, the, it, but it's just, if somebody wonders about it, it precludes that question. They can just look at the, oh, okay, I kind of get what that is, fine. I don't yeah. know all about it, fine. But the, I, I love that. There was incredible, um, an incredible product and, and that yeah 
the, 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 the photographs are, are beautiful. And I have since had a chance to revisit how I would approach doing that kind of thing where I actually did produce the images, but that was for another project. So I oh, hadn't, really? hadn't, yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, that was another one that came about from um, just being in touch with people and people that I'd done some work with. And it was, I, I was in touch with Brent Braun, who is a really cool dude who runs a company yeah. in the States doing magic development and consultancy. So if a lot of people who do say Fool Us or America's Got Talent will have Brent's consult. Mm. And he'd worked with this guy called Dustin Tavella who had actually won America's Got Talent um, a couple of years ago. Mm. And they wanted Dustin to go and, because he won, do the AGT live show in Las Vegas as the, the, the closer, you know, they, they've got all of the other acts on. He comes out and smashes it out of the park. And they had an idea of what they wanted to do for the finale, which was to have three images on stage, these big prints, because he's talking about, you know, what, the, um, what these photos mean. So he's got a photograph which needed to be of, I can remember it now, um, some drinks, like on a tropical beach. And this is printed out on this massive board that's like six foot across. And then the next photo needed to be like just some rooftops with some balloon, because these are like narratives that he's threading together through his act. And then the last one is a load of coins and money. And then what they wanted to do at the end is somebody's picked a word out of a book or like written it down or something. that They bring these three panels together and that the images spell out that word. Oh, wow. That's great. But it was a ginormous pain in the neck because of the restrictions that they wanted, which was that the words aren't three letter words. So they need the word like faith spreading, spelling out across these three images. And they wanted to have 10 different words so that they could rotate them through the sets. <laughs> so it was this ridiculous challenge to be able to come up with those. So I couldn't go out and just like photograph these things. So you couldn't have like the drinks forming the shape of a like an F because it also needs to have something that forms an A and then the next image finishes it off. So I ended up, that was, I, 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 I wish I could show it to you now, but they, I ended up doing the, um, a, whole, a whole load of those and it was a really complicated project. When it was about how to make the scenes in 3D inside the computer, work out all of the angles for all of the words, do these like beautiful high res renders and then send them off. But like, that's a, you know, it was, it was just some, for me, like a technical thing to come up with to solve this particular visual challenge. But, you know, he, he did it. He was like, if you'd gone and seen that show, I don't know if he's still, like, if he's still involved in the AGT because now they're making some changes in the live show in Vegas. But, you know, that was, so a lot of people saw that, which I feel great. I never saw it. <laughs> I mean, it's just it stuck over here. But that was like, because I, 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 all the time I had in mind that this was, I, I was bummed that I hadn't had a chance to do the words and the letters on the snaps deck. And I was like, this one, this is like, this is the, now I get to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That Sorry, awesome. it went on a bit of a tangent then, but that no, might, but the snaps is so nice. When you, if you like go and study art and design at university, often there'll be like a lens media or photography um, module. And, and actually that alphabet of images is quite a common project that um, students get given to do, which is like, here's a camera, go out and next week, I want you to come back and have a photos that look like all of those letters. And that's why I just love like that integration of that into magic. And, I, and it ties in with something that I like a lot in a lot of different aspects of magic, which is that the reveal is almost like it's an open prediction and it recontextualizes something that you've already seen. It kind of unpacks it and explains. Yeah, so I, 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 I like things where by, like, by you know, changing your perception or your understanding of what it is that you're looking at, there's a kind of revelation. We're like, damn, this was there all along. And I think that the reality is that's one of the reasons why, you know, when we're at Blackpool and stuff, people really like the... DMC elites is because them going from not being able to see the marks to being able to see them is itself like a little trick. Like they get to experience like, uh, it's almost like a trick that they're just like, you've given them the ability to 
see this thing that was there before them the whole time. And we always say, like, just remember what before somebody sees how the marks work, they can't see it at all. And we say to them, just remember how it feels not being able to see it. Because when we show you, you won't be able to not see it. And that's, I think, you know, that's the, the, one of the things that kind of like, I, I really like is that like change in perception, making a revelation. And that's what, that's what's great about the snaps is that, it, that you like these pictures turns, you, if you look at it now, it's, oh my God, that's the, you know, that's the word. But, yes. Wow. Wow. Really, really insightful. I want to ask you one question. What advice would you give to somebody in magic or mentalism that wants to create their own magic? They want to be a creator because I've talked about this on the channel before. I mentioned this to Luch briefly. Um, a lot of people that come into this industry, they, they look at the creators of magic and almost put them up on a pedestal. And I think very, very early on, a lot of people go, oh, I'd like my own name on a box. I'd like my own name in a book. I'd like to be the guy who produces the magic that everybody does. So I suppose two questions. One, any advice as for somebody who's created a lot of magic and mentalism, written a lot of books, and also helped a lot of other people do the same thing. Is, is there any advice on that subject? And two, would you, you know, I mean, well, actually, let's ask that question first. So do you have any advice on 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 creativity and 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 how people can be a creator in this industry and be more creative i think that there's a bit of a there's there's two things be, being more creative is something that like that that i think everyone can do and i think that it's it's important what we do is and people discuss this but it's ridiculous what we do is an art that you you know you communicate something of yourself to people and so the more creative you are the more that you're able to take what's in here and use it to create moments of like incredible amazement for other people and entertainment then then the better you know the more that you can put of yourself into what it is that you're doing then the you know that's that's i that's i that's ideal that's the dream um i don't know that becoming a creator in the magic industry is or perhaps should be like the dream um, the the reality is that the magic industry is not very big. That like um, you know the 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 uh, you go to Blackpool. Blackpool is the biggest magic convention in the world by quite a margin. And on a really big, we you've been to a Blackpool when it's really busy before the pandemic when it was heaving, and there's like five six thousand people there. I don't know how many it is, and it feels like there's a real buzz. Go to the um, go to the quilting fair at the NEC. Uh, quilting and sewing. Three full halls of the NEC exhibition centre. Thousands of exhibitors. It's in not. Who gives a shit about? Sorry, who gives a? I don't know. You swear that's fine. Who gives yeah. a damn about like the, about about quilting and sewing? Doesn't feel like it's a very big hobby. It's enormous. That's mm -hmm. a. That's a big industry. You know, like there's a lot of hobby industries that are huge. Magic's actually quite small, but we love it. And so what my suggestion would be that you, there's no, there's, there's, there's quite a low ceiling inside magic. And if you want to become a rock star by releasing things to the uh, industry, and I'm no, I don't, I don't know that you will, like, it, that it will be amazing that it will necessarily tickle all of your fancies in that regard. I've, I, I've enjoyed. I think I'm a hypocrite because that's what I do. I've enjoyed it, um, but I think perhaps be sort of realistic about what it is that you want to get out of it. If you want it to, if you want to do it because it's important to you personally, because that's how you express how you feel about magic or if you want to do like me I've got this idea about mentalism that I wanted just to I just wanted to tell everybody about it and try and see if anybody wanted to come on board with this sort of idea um that's the that's the reason to do it and, and it kind of like like a lot of art if if you're creating it for a reason other than because it's important to you that you know, might not be the right way to go about doing it. it you know and I think that you'll find that the people who have been successful in 
magic aren't people who've done it because they want to like you know get rich or um or like make a name for themselves they've done it because they kind of love magic and they have got these ideas and they want to push them out into the world and push them out into the universe so that they other people can enjoy them you know that's the that's the like the real reason for doing it in terms of like how to sort of be creative and come up with that everybody's got something else that's unique to them that that is important to them and that they find sort of resonant in their life and so you kind of have to roll that in and incorporate that into your like your approach so when i was a kid i was fascinated by the paranormal and the unexplained and ufos and psychics and sort of like exotic and bizarre things that happen in the world and so when i started working on my own material and developing that i kind of had that in the back of my mind the whole time that what i was doing was kind of an expression of that interest and so sort of it manifests as being that I'm interested in like psychic spies and like what was the history behind that? How did that come about? Or what aspects of how a person thinks are actually unique to them? Or, you know, it, it, and it's like, that's how it manifested. That it's like, I had these interests and I put those into what I did. And that's kind of the, I think in a way, that's a lot of the time, that's the sort of secret about finding your own sort of unique voice. Because there's, you know, there's like a million card tricks. And if the card trick is just a card trick, that's not that interesting. But if you look at, for example, um, Joshua J's trick balance, which is on the face of it, not, I don't think it's necessarily that exciting. He just balances a load of stuff. But the framing that he has for it, in a way is so unique to him that it's almost ridiculous that someone else might perform it because his framing is that he teaches magic and is in contact with people who are in prison in the American prison system. And they have very limited access to the things that we use for magic. And so he's like, this is the things that they have available to them. And this is something that somebody like showed him or something that came about. And that's why those things are the things that he uses. And like, if he hadn't have genuinely been involved in this project to help rehabilitate prisoners through giving them, you know, the, the interesting experience of learning and performing magic, he would never have come up with that trick. And I think that it was fantastically successful and unique. And it, but it, but it comes from something that was unique to him. Yeah. And I think that that's like, if you're interested in becoming creative, look at what there is inside you that is actually unique to you and find a way to manifest that through your art, through your creativity, whatever it is, if it's magic or just something else. Yeah, that's really, really, really good advice. This is amazing. I hope that everybody that's listening to this is listening very, very carefully because this is a master class. Yeah, you guys have better be testing, taking notes because we're going we're gonna to have a test at the end. Me and, uh, me and Craig are going to... A quiz. I, like that. I think we need to do that <laughs> in the comments <laughs> in the comment, comment quiz a comment quiz that's amazing um so you you've you worked on a load of projects with uh, uh, both your own and with other people one last question on on that this subject what um if, if somebody wants to bring their own trick out like let's say they've got the idea for a, a pack of cards and they think that it's going to be a great idea um, or they've got, um, you know, uh, something that involves design work, or maybe it's a book, whatever. What would you advise is the best way for them to go? Uh, they haven't got the ability to be able to do it themselves. Would you suggest going and trying to shop it around to a company, doing it yourself and going to somebody like you to design it and then shop it around to a company or or then ultimately release it because so many people do it different ways and you know there's a lot of people out there with good ideas but they just don't know what to do with it i was speaking to somebody the other week with an incredible idea and he just didn't know what to do with it and of course he hasn't got a name he's gone to like somewhere like a penguin magic and he said this yeah. is my idea and they're like hang on a minute we need to see a prototype right so what would what would you advise because so many different people do it different ways it's very tricky and it kind of comes down to partly what it is that you need designing or what it is that you're um that you're planning so 
part of this is that we're kind of dealing with still something that a lot of industries have dealt with, which is that um, technology is kind of like democratized the production of a lot of things in terms of the fact that, you know, I've got a computer here, which can do the work of like, you know, a lot of different people would have had to have been involved to do like, say, my the book design. And so just one dude can do that now. And in the olden days, if I wanted to do a print run of a book, you have to have it lipo printed and it has to be hand bound and all this sort of stuff. So you would have had to have had thousands of books done, which means that you can, it's only worth your while publishing a book if you're going to sell thousands of them, which is in our industry, maybe you won't, especially if it's a niche of a niche, like mentalism, the bit that I work in, is a, is a niche of a niche. And if the magic industry is small, the mentalism industry is even smaller. Mm. Um, but now you can do print runs of like one book by using everybody's familiar with like Lulu, or you can use eBooks to reach people. It used to be with playing cards that if you wanted to have a deck of playing cards printed, you had to use USPCC to do it. And their custom department would only print 5,000 decks of playing cards, which, as you can imagine, if they cost like $3 per deck, if you've not got 15 grand to do it, you can't do it. Whereas now, if you want to be able to produce a very high quality deck of cards and you want one of them for a prototype, for example, or even just for your own personal use, there's companies online that will do that. So this company, makeplaincards.com, is a, they've got a factory in China. And they'll make one-off decks. I've got loads of them because I use them for my prototypes. When we're doing something, we're doing a new deck or we're doing, you know, some project for somebody, then that's my sort of my go-to for that. But so it, it's not the same as it used to be. You had to, in the past, go through a publisher or a producer because there's, like, there's no way for you to do the fabrication or the production. There's also no way for you to reach any potential customers. Whereas now, if you've got Facebook and Instagram, you can reach those people because you can speak directly to them using that technology. So mm. I think that that's one. It, it's hard for you to make the excuse, there's no way for me to do it. And I watched you having a debate with somebody on your channel, and they said, I had this idea, but there was no way that I could do it. And you basically said, why didn't you just do it yourself? You could just have written an ebook and just put it out. Yeah. There's no... His, his explanation was he didn't know that that existed, which now everybody watching this definitely doesn't have that excuse because everybody knows that that's a possibility. One knows yep. ebooks are a thing. But some people bemoan the fact that it's become too easy to publish things inside the magic industry. But it just means that you have to have a good filter as a buyer because you know that there's a lot of stuff out there that perhaps isn't quite as polished. Um, so, you know, whether somebody needs to go through um, those companies. It, 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 it's possible to develop those skills yourself. I, I don't. No one ever taught me how to design a deck of playing cards. No one ever really taught me how to like lay out a book. I just had a Mac and I knew how to push some pixels around, and I kind of worked it out. Um, and so it's it, it's it's physically like it's physically possible for somebody to do that to produce their own stuff and for it to look like polished. And there's people on websites online who will be able to help you for do design and stuff for a relatively small amount of money versus coming to me which is a relatively like large amount of money because i'm the specialist so it's not like somebody has to go through uh, penguin or murphy's if you want to be a you know if you want to be a, a a rock star and go through those people it may be that going your own way and doing some smaller personal releases first is the is the way to go i think in a lot of creative industries because it's so accessible for people to do their own development and research and releases um a lot of the time when you go to a company with an idea even in other industries they'll want to see that you've got the initiative and that you care enough about it to put yourself out to be able to do it so if you are like people who want to work in the games industry for example often they'll ask you know, what mods have you done? What, you know, what, how are you involved in creating fan made content? Because if you actually care about games, you could be doing it, you mm -hmm. know, or people who go into programming and like what open source projects have you worked on? Because if you are capable and passionate about programming and about this part of the industry, why haven't you done it yourself? Why haven't you got involved in some way? And so yeah. there's loads of different ways that people can like get their ideas out so it's not just going into a full release if you send an idea to a magic magazine or you know 
to be put into a, a project with other people or even just sharing it on forums and things. There's loads of different opportunities and avenues. That's kind of one of the ways in which I started off was working like writing on forums. That's one of the reasons why I started writing up my ideas is because I'd had an idea for a trick and I wanted to tell somebody about that idea for the trick. And we're on a forum. You've got to write it up. You've got to write it. Hmm. And so people, it's quite a lot of people had seen my stuff online. So when I'm like, oh yeah, I've written a book, it's not their first point of contact with me. So, cause otherwise, why would they, why would they care? Why would they buy that book? Yeah. So if yeah. you're like, if you're passionate and you, you want to actually like endure and have an opportunity to carry on working in the industry and producing things that people are interested in, then you kind of need to prove it yeah. by, you know, producing stuff and, taking control of it yourself i think there you go that i didn't realize i had an answer for that but that's my answer you have <laughs> it's a great answer as well and then just wait 20 years of non-stop effort and you maybe craig will interview you <laughs> that's all, all that was my journey it's guaranteed a, there you go you peaked it's amazing um i mean what's outside of your own material of course you've written multiple books and projects what's been your favorite project that you've worked on That's a really good question. Um, I've worked on I've worked on a few things which were sort of doing things for shows rather than um, like necessarily in the industry. So I've, I've I've liked I've liked doing a lot of the work that I've done with Penguin and with Murphy's and just you know I, I, I like just like packaging for things. It's cool to see when you see something on the shelf. Oh, I did that, mm. but. Um, with a, like a, a, if I've done like some consulting with somebody for a live show or for some kind of like something that's like actually been exposed to the sort of the broader universe, that's very re rewarding for somebody. I, I guess that's my version as like the backroom guy of doing the show, being on stage. So the same thing that I would get if I was actually performing for people. There's a little part of me is like, oh, I did that. So I did um, like that thing for Dustin that I mentioned was a real technical challenge. And it was one of those things, I don't think anyone else could have done it the way that I did. And knowing that he'd been using that as part of his performance, you know, mm. um, was quite exciting. But I did, you know, I did consulted and developed a load of material for a TV show in the UK called Impossible. And that got me a really fun experience of being on set whilst the TV show is being made, which is interesting, you know. I wouldn't have had that otherwise. I wouldn't know what that was all about. And as someone like everyone who watches a load of TV, a little part of me is like, I know what that's like. I know what's going on there. It's that was great. cool. It, it didn't go anywhere and didn't, didn't like have any grand effect in, in the universe, but it was really nice. And it was great to, for there to be something that I'd done that normal people could experience. And, um, I got an opportunity to do some motion graphics for um, Shin Lim's show in Las Vegas, his show Limitless that he performs with uh, Colin Cloud, because I know Colin. Um, they were retooling the show and <laughs> the first two people that they'd got to do this motion graphics for the big screens had bailed out and I'd just done something for Colin which had just got a bit of animation involved in it and he sort of suggested to the rest of the creative team that I could maybe do this and so I ended up getting that project I, it wasn't a lot of time to do it I pitched low because I really wanted to do it and I hadn't done it before but if you go and see that show in Las Vegas it's got this massive screens in the back and these two screens on either side and these other screens. Everything that's on those screens throughout the show, although it's not magic, it's just graphics. I did it. I did that. That's great. And that was really cool. That was quite exciting. And then when we went to um, Magic Live, which is in Las Vegas earlier this year, I went with Roxana and we saw the show. And we're in this theater with like 1,500 people in it. And the whole time I want to turn around and be like, I did that. I did that. That was me. I did that. You like that? I did that. <laughs> That's you know, cool. it just it, it's not like it's very proud of. Yeah, I was just, and it was, and it was cool because that was something that, um, in terms of like the technical aspect of it, of being able to do it, it's something that I'd actually quite recently been developing this, you know, like extra, you know, just using the software for that particular thing. It's not something that I'd done before, so it was the first time I'd ever done that, kind of, and it was this cool thing inside the magic industry, and I think that. I don't know. There you go. Just 
I, I was. I guess you can tell. I'm really proud about that. I was yeah, super excited to be there. Should be as well, 100%. But you mean you mentioned Murphys and Penguin a couple of times there, and you should be proud of that as well, because let's be honest, Murphys are a big company. I mean, uh, you know, they're decent sized, and they've got their own in-house design company, they've got their own in-house designers, and yet they come to you regularly and go, actually, we want Phil to do this. Now, they don't have to do that. They've got their own team in yeah, house. Yeah. And the fact that, like, I think we're working on our third project now with Murphys, you and me directly, I mean, that just says everything to me that they're like, well, you know, we want to pay this guy. Um, and like you say, he's not the cheapest because he works the best. And it's like, we want to pay this guy to do this because we want it to be the best it can be. And 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 Phil will make that happen. I mean, that's, you know, something to be so proud yeah, of. Yeah, no, it always, it always uh, you know, it means a lot always when I, some, <laughs> anytime someone's like, you know, I, I want you to to do this yeah great like well i'm happy with what you've done in the past do it again brilliant yeah you know it's just like getting a repeat booking for a gig or something if the client says we all liked what you did that's it that's the whole thing you, that's what you want yeah so yeah, yeah it does no it is always means i didn't mean to diminish it by saying i was quite excited about it, it was just because i've done a lot of these things now and oh no I mean, production yeah, i love you it's just you nice to do something new always yeah, you, you're designing stuff for Vegas shows. For I mean, it's it's incredible, really. Yeah, you know? mate, but that is, I think that that's kind of like the mecca for magicians, isn't it? You think about yeah. big magic shows. It's Las Vegas, so it's always kind of like the I don't know. Like my my, um, my friend Peter Antonio is uh, a mentalist, and he went over to the US and did America's Got Talent, um, and he has been hosting AGT Live in Las Vegas, and. It just, I'm like, you know, I'm super proud of him because I remember talking way, way, way back in the day with him about like, what's your ultimate goal in magic? And he was like, I'd love to perform on the Las Vegas Strip. And so like, you know, he's there and like, I kind of little bit, I'm there as well. Like I've got a little bit, you know, I don't think I could sustain doing it actually live like him, but as long as they can put some of my stuff up on a screen somewhere, then and that's fun. That's nice. Happy with that. I kind of look at it like this. If you could go back and speak to yourself in university, somebody who's really interested in design, somebody who's really interested in magic and mentalism and say, well, 20 plus years time, you're going to have done this, 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 and this. Oh, and this, and this, and this. Yeah. I'm sure your uh, your 20 year old self would be going, damn, that's, yeah, I'll take that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, 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 for sure. No, yeah, I think that that's, um, it's going okay. It's yeah. good. Absolutely. And then some. So one last question. Uh, well, two class questions, actually. Uh, but the first one. What if somebody's watching this and they want to work with you and they've got an idea and they're thinking, you know what? Phil's the guy that I can speak to about this. How complete an idea do they have to have in order to come to you? And what I mean by that is this project that we've just had the proofs for that I showed you a couple of seconds ago. I had the idea for the project, but you developed a lot of aspects of that with the marking system and the design and so on and so forth. I had like 60% of it and you fleshed out the other 40%. Like how far along, do, like can someone come to you and go, make me a magic trick and put my name in it and I'll pay you. Like what, what, where do they need to be in order to uh, not waste your time? Um, I mean, it, it kind of, it comes down to, like what they what they want to do what their workflow is and and if somebody came to me and said i want you to make a magic trick and put my name on it i'll do that but it's just going to cost more because yeah. i have to do more work um so some people like for example if i'm doing a, like a book design for example if somebody comes to me i'm doing i don't know if this is a top secret or not but um murphy's have got a bunch of books coming out at some point soon which are like reprints of old books and I'm doing some design on those. And so they are fully cast in stone. There's no change in that or anything. It's already a book that's been released, but they want it to be modernized and look like a modern version. So that's one thing. That's like, they've just, it's done. And so they just need somebody to make it look nice, which I'm quite happy to do. And there's, there's an element of needing to understand magic to work out how the flow of the book is going to help somebody learn it. So I can do that. But the other end of the spectrum is like my friend John Carey is that I work on the books with him, which is that sometimes like so I'll 
he'll just put a load of um, like Word documents together and send them over to me. And I'll kind of do everything with him. So I'll, I'll, I'll do the, the um, editing the book, doing all of the spell checking, like doing all of the photography and illustrations. We used to meet up quite a lot, but I'd take a load, just film him doing all of these things. And then like do the design, design the cover, handle the print, make trailers for it, write the emails out to everybody, set the website up to sell it on, you know, because the, the, he is brilliant at doing what, what he does, the John Carey stuff. And he's like, I don't care about any of that stuff. I don't know about it. I'm not interested in doing it. I want to, I'm, I'm too busy writing the next book or, you know, teaching magic tricks and stuff. And so it's kind of, you know, it's, as much, it's a movable thesis as much as somebody wants. So I quite, I do quite like working with, um, you know, like like Murphys and people like that. I've worked a lot with Luch, like you said, and I think part of it is because they know that they can come to me with something that's sort of ninety five percent of the way there, ninety percent of the way there, eighty five percent of the way there, and that I'll be able to plug the gap, like the last eight, uh, fifteen percent. So Luch has got a trick. Is it out yet? Coming out soon, which involved a particular prop, and he needed to be able to communicate with the manufacturer for it and it I kind of ended up like taking what his description of it was and designing or pretty much designing the, the prop not just the print and everything but I think you told me it. about this this is the thing with the question mark I'm not going to go any further but yeah we did um, and yeah and he and he knows from all of the work that we've done the I can I can help use the design to help with the method Mm -hmm. so he just like he knows how much he needs to bring in but just from having done a, a, a lot of that work and I think the, the more I work with people as well I think that maybe we'll we'll sync up in this way as well that you understand or like Luch understands or you know whoever I've done work with in the past understand which bits I can do so which bits you need to do less of in terms of so you know you now know that if you, you can just say to me mark it <laughs> you and you, that's it. You don't have to worry about that. It's going to be a given that it will work. And so it's that. That's why I quite like that sort of like ongoing, almost like negotiation. And it's mm. a little bit like what I've said before about the cards is that if you just do one project, you can do your best and it can be pretty good. But if you do multiple projects, then you can listen to the feedback and refine the way that you work and the way that the actual, you know, the product is, and gradually get something you know better and better and better. And that's why that's why it's nice. I think that's why some of these people, like like Luch, for example, is like come back because if he, <laughs> I've got him, I've, I've tracked him. If he wants to go to another designer, he's got to start from scratch. <laughs> I've caught him, and he's ensnared. That's a really good point, actually. I've met, I've spoken to so many people that use you, and they never go anywhere else. It's like you know, once you go to Phil Smith, that's it. There's no need to go anywhere else ever again. That's so, nice. It's nice. It's nice to it's nice to hear that. I know that that's, you know, I, 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 I work quite hard on what it is that I'm doing for people and trying to figure out what their vision is for how they want it to look and feel, and then being able to um, use the technical stuff that I know yeah. to get it over the line. Like I did this thing you mentioned, David Jonathan, David Jonathan and Nicholas Mabresis. I've worked on a few things with those guys. And they had a project recently, which was called Fortuna, I think. And they had everything done, absolutely everything done. But one of the reveals from this thing, which is a multiple out, they just knew it had to be a particular way. And it would take them ages. I'm sure that they could do it between them, but it would take them ages to get it just right. And they're like, this is a fail thing. It's very specifically because it was like it was a recontextualizing of something that was already in plain view, which is, you know, that's my... That's my thing. I can, you know, that's what I'm, I'm interested in. Mm. And so they just came to me and was like, "This is how we want it to be. Just do your, do the, do your, do your thing." And that, that was, you know, they, they didn't need me to do any of the rest of the stuff. It looks great. The trick looks great. And that little bit that I did kind of plugs the gap. And it was mm. that, like I said, it was the last five percent. That was cool. So it was nice to, have, you know, contributed in that way. That's amazing. Well, last last question, last question, which is, what's next? Um, 
And what I mean by that is you've achieved so much. You've written so many books. I mean, we haven't even really talked much about the books that you've written, but we've got, you've written so many books. You've done so much. You've, you've, you've helped so many people. Your company is a huge success. Is there anything left on your magical stroke mentalism bucket list that you haven't done that you'd like to achieve? Is there something in your head that you go, you know what? I'd like to do that. Yeah, yes, but I am always loath to say what the next thing is. Not just because I'm like trying to keep my powder dry and I want to keep it a secret, but there's this, I don't know if you I don't know if you know this, this there's some research that suggests that when somebody has a plan for something that they want to achieve, if they tell people about it, telling people kind of sates their need to do it. Oh, really? I yeah. So if somebody's like, I'm going to lose weight, if you just decide you're going to lose weight and then go away and lose weight, you're more likely to succeed than if you tell everybody that you're going to lose weight and you explain how you're going to do it, apparently, because there's some part of you that like telling people satisfies the need to do it. So you're less driven to do it, even though you think it would be the other way around now because everyone else is going to like hold you accountable to it. But apparently that's not the case. So I've got a few things. There's a couple of things. One of them I decided recently that I'm going to try and do in 2023. Uh, and, and if it happens, it happens. There's a, like, yeah, there's a few things that I've got sort of lined up. I kind of want to, um, I work a lot with these, uh, my friends, Luke and John, who if people have been to Blackpool and, and met me, these, these two uh, very talented, very cool guys that I like to work with. And they've got a lot of nice ideas in magic. And I kind of a little part of me wants to <laughs> bully them into um, like releasing some more of their stuff and um, helping them with that. Um, is, it a, is it a secret? I'm kind of working on a project very slowly in the background with my friend Mars. Um, Mars is incredible. He's incredible. No one knows that Mars is incredible. Right, I do. No one knows that you know. Yeah. But if you like, I think people, like I said, they know him from decisions. No one knows. Like every time I meet up with Mars, he will show me something, and it's just, it's just the, it's ridiculous. It's insane, and it's always, it's just like he'll sit there and just like absolutely fall the pants off you, know? and like we'll be there with a bunch of very knowledgeable magicians, and he'll just like casually smash them. With just something is just like, oh, I found this in my drawer the other day. Oh, I forgot I'd been working on this. Let me show you this. Just, you know, crushes them. And it's always got, it's got a very good, um, like, mind for magic. Mm. That he just will, he'll watch something and, like, know how it's done. And then he'll make a version of it that fixes the problems with the first one or whatever. Brilliant. Love, just love the way that he approaches things. And I kind of, like, want to, I want people, I want people to, no and again i feel like i'm just bullying him into sticking his neck out a bit more so i'm working on something in the background with him so that's that's not necessarily um me but like it's it's using some of what i've learned to try and put out into the world something that i want to see i want to see these projects that i'm working on with these guys i want to see them i want them for me but no one else is going to do them so i better do them wow yeah, because Mars hasn't put anything out for a long time. He, but he's always coming up with stuff. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he's got so much material. He could, like, literally put a trick out every single week and it would blow yeah. people's minds. Yeah. So, I don't, there you go. That's the, that's, that's upcoming. I'm, it's still all in development. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how long any of those things are going to take to happen. But It's exciting. Yeah, I think I think so. I think it's nice to be able to like use what I've learned to be able to shine a light on things that I'm like. I, I, when I first did my first book, I was like, I think that this is important. You know, everyone look at this, understand this, read this, and and some of the things that I think are important that people should be paying attention to now are things that aren't my ideas. You know, they're like the ideas of Luke and John, the sort of their style and their approach and way of thinking, or they're the ideas of Mark, which you know. We, people who know him and who are in the industry, know really well. But like, I think a lot of people who are coming up in magic or learning about magic would find the things that he's doing really good fun. And they'd be fascinated by the methods. They'd enjoy performing them for their families, you know. Yeah. I want, I want to, like I said, like I said, shine a light on that. That's great. That's absolutely fantastic. And before I wrap this whole interview up, 
Um, let's talk very quickly about, because you've released a lot of magic and mentalism and books, and we've talked about this over the course of the interview. Um, if people want to get a flavor of the type of material that you put out, A, where would they go to buy that? Because a lot of your material doesn't go into a Murphy's or a Penguin, or it's available just directly from you. So unless they see you at a convention, where can they go to find this? And also, if somebody wanted to get an idea of the type of magic and mentalism that you did, and they were going to buy one thing to see if it floats their boat, what would, what's available right now from you that they could get to kind of give them that idea? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so if somebody's interested in learning some of the things that I do, um, I've got, I, I did a penguin lecture quite a long time ago. Um, which is not the like the God, I was just looking at that. I've got the little penguin penguin thing up there. 2015. That was a long time ago. Hmm. So that's pretty good. 2015. Um, some of the reviews are very positive. Some of the reviews say I'm too like my jacket's too tight. So that was nice. Uh, hey. <laughs> I've lost a tiny bit of weight since then. So you guys will have to just tolerate that. It was a bit of a it was not my best performance at the penguin, but it's it, it, it conveys a lot of stuff. I teach some good stuff in there. There's a good um Alakazam one of their sort of live things I went and did with um, Peter and uh, the guys down there. That's pretty good fun. And there's a lot of material on there. I think we spent two nights doing it. There's a huge amount of stuff. So yeah. if that's good value, however much it costs. Um, if somebody wants to pick up one thing that conveys like my vibe, do you know, honestly, I think it might be the, um, the alphas. This is one of my favorite things to perform. Um, and we did uh, previously, me and Drummond worked on these texts, um, teaching tricks for the DMC elites and the alphas. And we used to, they were called passports, these little books, the size of a passport that we would um, sell or you could get them for a discount when you bought the decks. And I kind of realized that what I wanted was more people to be able to access this stuff. So we just put them on our website now. So people would just download these PDFs and um, you know, read how we're approaching some of these tricks. Um, and so if somebody if you went to dmcmagic.com or store.dmcmagic.com and click on the thing at the top that says download passports it's, you can just download those and read them and if you think that they're cool then you have to get the deck to perform it obviously that's why this is a great plan uh, right. <laughs> um, but this I'm, I'm kind of like yeah I'm in, in a bunch of different places the, the, I mean the ultimate sort of expression of this is the book that I developed which is this mythology codex which is on the website um, Miscellaneous Miracles, but is it terrible as an introduction if you want to find out about my stuff because it's so flipping expensive and it's enormous. So that's not the one. Um, probably one of my lectures. I quite like doing those lectures. They're all good fun. But yeah, so it's that on the, 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 the decks we sell on that store.dmcmagic.com and all of the other tricks on uh, miscellaneousmiracles.co.uk. And I think that uh, any one of them really has got a nice little slice. You did a review of um, Inexplicable Thrift Store Fine, which oh, is one of Ryland. my favourite little weird bits to do. Ryland loves that. He does it every single chance he can. It, it's amazing. And I think it's great as well. It's such a, it's so easy. And I remember you showing that to me at the session convention and fooling the pants off me. I just couldn't work out. It's quite a, it's it's quite a characterful it. little piece. It, yeah, mm. I think maybe that's the, that's the, that's the ideal Phil Smith piece. It uses spoiler it uses quinter which is a, a really cool method that i came up with it's got a nice bit of design because it's got this sort of vintagey feel to it it's got a nice bit of narrative mm. which is ties in with some of the things i'm interested in yeah there you go that's it inexplicable thrift store fine that's the that's the phil smith experience condensed down perfect all right i and and seriously people can go and watch the review and the performance i think it's a great trick brilliant Really, 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 really good. And we're going to be reviewing some more of your things as well. And we're going to be some reviewing some of the alphas and, and so on and so forth and DMCs. But uh, cool. wow. I mean, you've done so much. And uh, this has been an incredible interview, uh, Phil. It really it's has. It's been a long interview. I let that everyone else can judge whether it's incredible or not. Oh, no. This is like on a rating of, uh, let's see, Jasper Cherry going up to Ma uh, going up to Mark Spellman because Mark Spellman was about six and a half hours long. Um, <laughs> you, 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 you just blow the halfway point. There's been Perfect. a lot. That's what I'm going for. Half a Mark Spellman. Half a Mark Spellman. That's where we're at. 
right Good enough now. for me. Off Mark Wellman. I think you've pretty much fallen, looking at the uh, the clock, I think we've pretty much fallen in line with Luch as well. Literally Perfect. To the minute. So there you go. And Andy Nyman. You, Luch, and Andy Nyman are all on exactly the same level. So. Just the dream team. Absolutely. 100%. But no, it has been an incredible interview. And thank you so much, Phil. Uh, I'm going to put all the links down to your social media and uh, down to your websites down below. If people want to check out your stuff, they can do so. If people want to buy DMCs, they can do so. It's an incredible deck. Uh, the alphas especially are just awesome. And also, if people have an idea for a routine or a trick or something that they want to create, they can reach out to you. They can connect with you and they can you know, speak to you about that, right? That's Yes. I'm very busy at the moment, but I'd love to hear what people are working I know, and I feel I've just made you even busy. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Craig, what are you doing? I'm trying to do some work for you, Craig. For sorry. you. <laughs> very sorry about that. Oh, dear me. Dear, dear me. Well, you can you can reach it. He's a bit like the A-team. If you if you can get hold of him and you can reach out to him, then maybe you can hire Phil Smith. That's that's what it is. You're the A-team of magic. How's that that's it. Oh, that's good. I'll put that on my business card. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, guys, do me a favor, leave a comment down below and let Phil know what you thought. Uh, this has been an incredible interview. I've loved every second of it and it's been fantastic. To There's been it. a lot of them to love. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, 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 there's a lot of interviews. You are, Luch, uh, you're going on straight after Luch. So Luch was number 200, so you're 201. So. Perfect. Great timing. There you go. Absolutely. So I want everyone to leave a comment down below. Uh, let Phil know everything. Uh, go and check out the social media. Go buy lots of stuff. And uh, one more time, Phil, thank you so much. Thanks and for having me, Craig. It's been a pleasure. No problem. Guys, uh, on behalf of Phil, thank you very much for checking us out. And I'll be back again soon. Thank you very much. We'll see you again right here on Magic TV.